Madame Lefebvre was a country dame, a widow, one of these half-peasants with ribbons and bonnets with trimming on them, one of those persons who clipped her words and put on great airs in public, concealing the soul of a pretentious animal beneath a comical and bedizened exterior, just as the country folks hide their coarse red hands in ecro silk gloves. She had a servant, a good simple peasant, called Rose. The two women lived in a little house with green shutters by the side of the high road in Normandy, in the centre of the country of Caux. As they had a narrow strip of garden in front of the house, they grew some vegetables. One night someone stole twelve onions. As soon as Rose became aware of the theft, she ran to tell Madame, who came downstairs in her woollen petticoat. It was a shame and a disgrace. They had robbed her, Madame Lefeuve. As there were thieves in the country, they might come back. And the two frightened women examined the foot tracks, talking and supposing all sorts of things. See, they went that way. They stepped on the wall. They jumped into the garden. And they became apprehensive for the future. How could they sleep in peace now? The news of the theft spread. The neighbours came, making examinations and discussing the matter in turn, while the two women explained to each newcomer what they had observed and their opinion. A farmer who lived near said to them, You ought to have a dog. That is true, they ought to have a dog, if it were only to give the alarm. Not a big dog. Heavens! What would they do with a big dog? He would eat their heads off. But a little dog. In Normandy they say Quinn. A little puppy who would bark. As soon as everyone had left, Madame Lefeuve discussed this idea of a dog for some time. On reflection, she made a thousand objections, terrified at the idea of a bowl of soup for she belonged to that race of parsimonious country women, who always carry some teams in their pocket to give alms in public to beggars on the road and put in the Sunday collection plate. Rose, who loved animals, gave her opinion and defended it shrewdly, so it was decided they should have a dog, a very small dog. They began to look for one, but could find nothing but big dogs who would devour enough soup to make one shudder. The grocer at Roville had one, a tiny one, but he demanded two francs to cover the cost of sending it. Madame Lefeuille declared that she would feed a quin, but would not buy one. The baker, who knew all that occurred, bought in his wagon one morning a strange little yellow animal, almost without paws, with the body of a crocodile, the head of a fox and a curly tail, a true cockade, as big as all the rest of him. Madame Lefeuve thought this common cur, that cost nothing, was very handsome. Rose hugged it, and asked what its name was. Pierrot, replied the baker. The dog was installed in an old soap box, and they gave it some water, which it drank. They then offered it a piece of bread. He ate it. Madame Lefeuve, uneasy, had an idea. When he is thoroughly accustomed to the house, we can let him run. He can find something to eat, roaming about the country. They let him run, in fact, which did not prevent him from being famished. Also, he never barked except to beg for food. And then he barked furiously. Anyone might come into the garden and Piero would run up and fawn on each one in turn, and not utter a bark. Madame Lefeuve, however, had become accustomed to the animal. She even went so far as to like it, and gave it from time to time pieces of bread, soaked in the gravy on her plate. But she had not once thought of the dog tax, and when they came to collect eight francs, eight francs, madam, for this puppy that never barked, she almost fainted from the shock. 
It was immediately decided that they must get rid of Piero. No one wanted him. Everyone declined to take him for ten leagues around. Then they resolved, not knowing what else to do, to make him Piquet de Mar. Piquet de Mar means to eat chalk. When one wants to get rid of a dog, they make him Piquet de Mar. In the midst of an immense plain, one sees a kind of hut, or rather a small roof standing above the ground. This is the entrance to the chalk pit. A big perpendicular hole is sunk for twenty metres underground, and ends in a series of long subterranean tunnels. Once a year they go down into the quarry at the time they fertilise the ground. The rest of the year it serves as a cemetery for condemned dogs. And as one passed by this hole, plaintive howls, furious or despairing barks, and lamentable appeals reach one's ear. Sportsmen's dogs and sheep dogs flee in terror from this mournful place, and when one leans over it, one perceives a disgusting odour of putrefaction. Frightful dramas are enacted in the darkness. When an animal has suffered down there for ten or twelve days, nourished on the far remains of his predecessors, another animal, larger and more vigorous, is thrown into the hole. There they are, alone, starving, with glittering eyes. They watch each other, follow each other, hesitate in doubt, but hunger impels them. They attack each other, fighting desperately for some time and the stronger eats the weaker, devours him alive. When it was decided to make Pierrot piqûre de main, they looked around for an executioner. The labourer who mended the road demanded six sous to take the dog there. That seemed wildly exorbitant to Madame Lefebvre. The neighbour's hired boy wanted five sous. That was still too much. Sir so Rose having observed that they had better carry it there themselves, as in that way it would not be brutally treated on the way, and made to suspect its fate, they resolved to go together at twilight. They offered the dog that evening a good dish of soup with a piece of butter in it. He swallowed every morsel of it, and as he wagged his tail with delight, Rose put him in her apron. They walked quickly, like thieves, across the plain. They soon perceived the chalk pit, and walked up to it. Madame Lefebvre leaned over to hear if any animal was moaning. No, there was none there. Piero would be alone. Then Rose, who was crying, kissed the dog, and threw him into the chalk pit, and they both leaned over, listening. First they heard a dull sound of an animal in pain, then a succession of little mournful cries, then despairing appeals, the cries of a dog who is entreating, his head raised towards the opening of the pit. He yelped, oh how he yelped! They were filled with remorse, with terror, with a wild inexplicable fear, and ran away from the spot. As Rose went faster, Madame Lefebvre cried, Wait for me, Rose! Wait for me! At night they were haunted by frightful nightmares. Madame Lefebvre dreamed she was sitting down at a table to eat her soup. But when she uncovered the tureen, Pierrot was in it. He jumped out and bit her nose. She awoke and thought she heard him yelping still. She listened, but she was mistaken. She fell asleep again, and found herself on a high road, an endless road, which she followed. Suddenly, in the middle of the road, she perceived a basket, a large farmer's basket lying there. And this basket frightened her. She ended by opening it, and Piero, concealed in it, seized her hand and would not let go. She ran away in terror with the dog hanging to the end of her arm, which he held between his teeth. At daybreak she arose, almost beside herself, 
and ran to the chalk pit. He was yelping, yelping still. He had yelped all night. She began to sob and called him by all sorts of endearing names. He answered her with all the tender inflections of his dog's voice. Then she wanted to see him again, promising herself that she would give him a good home till he died. She ran to the chalk digger, whose business it was to excavate for chalk, and told him the situation. The man listened, but said nothing. When she had finished, he said, "'You want your dog? That'll cost you four francs.' She gave a jump. All her grief was at an end at once. Four francs, she said. You would die of it. Four francs. Do you suppose I'm going to bring my ropes, my windlass, and set it up, and go down there with my boy, and let myself be bitten, perhaps, by your cursed dog, for the pleasure of giving it back to you? You should not have thrown it down there. She walked away, indignant. Four francs. As soon as she entered the house, she called Rose and told her of the quarryman's charges. Rose, always resigned, repeated, Four francs? That is a good deal of money, madam. Then she added, If we could throw him something to eat, the poor dog, so he will not die of hunger? Madame Lefebvre approved of this and was quite delighted. So they set out again with a big piece of bread and butter. They cut it into mouthfuls, which they threw down one after the other, speaking by turns to Piero. As soon as the dog finished one piece, he yelped for the next. They returned that evening and the next day and every day, but they only made one trip. One morning, as they were just letting fall the first mouthful they suddenly heard a tremendous barking in the pit. There were two dogs there. Another had been thrown in. A large dog. Piero, cried Rose. And Piero yelped and yelped. Then they began to throw down some food. But each time they noticed distinctly a terrible struggle going on. Then plaintive cries from Piero, who had been bitten by his companion who ate everything up as he was the stronger. It was in vain that they specified, saying, This is for you, Piero. Piero evidently got nothing. The two women, dumbfounded, looked at each other, and Madame Lefeuve said in a sour tone, I could not feed all the dogs they throw in there. We must give it up and suffocating at the thought of all the dogs living at her expense she went away even carrying back what remained of the bread which she ate as she walked along rose followed her wiping her eyes on the corner of her blue apron